Hello, my name is Stephanie Müller, and I'm presenting my opinion, which is joint work between the Plattner Institute and Cornell University. So here's what we do. But let me start at the beginning. So our work is motivated by the fact that 3D printing is actually very slow. So printing this small model here already takes two hours, and if you print larger objects, it takes even longer. So this actually limits how fast designers can iterate because they have to repeatedly wait for the machine to finish. Using Vibrant, I can actually have a first version of this model here in only 14 minutes, which is eight times faster than a traditional and since Bioprint preserves the overall shape of the object, I can actually quickly test things such as the ergonomic fit here. And if I notice that the bot is too small, I can, I can quickly um, reprint another version, for instance, make it thicker, test it, and have a lot of iterations in a very short time. And only at the very end, when I'm really happy with my design, I invest the time and make a full screen. So Bioprint is part of a larger concept which we presented at Kai this year, which we call LoFab. So LoFab allows designers to have more iterations in less time, which ultimately leads to a better design. So in contrast to the traditional workflow in which the 3D model is always fabricated as a slow, high fidelity version, LoFab actually fabricates all the intermediate versions as fast, low fidelity versions. And as I said, only at the end we really invest the time to make a full speed print. So at Kai, we showed our low pep system fabricator that substitutes subfoils of the 3D model with Lego bricks. And it uses 3D printing only for the few parts that require the high resolution of the 3D printer. So fabricator is fast, but as you can see, it represents the overall shape of the object only on a very core hours level. <coughs> So Bioprint, in contrast, preserves the shape very well and it's just very useful for design iterations where shape is really important. So in the remaining time of this talk, I want to go over the challenges we actually face while implementing Bioprint. So the first one was the transition from raster to vector printing. So from printing layer-wise to actually printing in 3D space. So Bioframes that are printed layer-wise are actually widely as a means for artistic expression. So when we started the project, we actually asked ourselves, can we also use this for fast prototyping? So we did a small test in which we printed a cube as a wireframe and as a solid object. And both were printed layer by layer. So while the wireframe model was two times faster, we were actually wondering why it was only a speed up of 2x and not much more, because as you can see, there are no faces, there's no input material. So we found that the main reason for this is that the path for the printhead actually remains almost the same. So since the material is printed layer-wise, the printhead actually has to traverse the entire cube outline, has to move from corner to, more, to corner bottom up, which makes it very small. So in the next step, we actually printed a cube by extruding the edges vertically, so by moving the printhead up and down. And it turns out that vector printing is really much faster than layer-wise printing. So in this case, it was 11 times faster. So knowing that vector printing is indeed much faster than layer-wise printing, our next goal was to make vector printing available to a broad audience. And for this, it had to work on standard 3D printers. So initially, we felt we would probably need a robot arm to make vector printing work. But then we realized that 3D printers are actually 3 axis robotic arms. However, currently the full potential of the Z axis is disregarded as it is only used to move the printer by 0.2 millimeter up for the next layer. So we understood that vector printing is just merely a software question. So if you want to test vector printing on your own 3D printer at home, you only need to write a few lines of G code. So G-code are the instructions that tell the 3D printer where to move, how much material to extrude, and how fast to move. 
So to test this at home, you only have to set the printhead speed. Then you move the printhead to the origin. And from there, you can move the printhead up and extrude material on the way. And that's it, basically. So all you need is to paste these lines into your 3D printing software and execute them. So here's the little cube test we did in the first release. So as you can see, it kind of works, but the edges really do not look good here. They are not really straight, there's too much material extruded, the material also sagged a lot, so there's definitely space for me. And also this cube model here is very simple, and we found out that making vector printing work for arbitrary model geometries is actually much more challenging. So in the next couple of minutes, I will tell you a little bit more about the challenges we face when printing more complex model on a three-axis 3D printer. So initially I actually thought, maybe we can just use the existing edges of a 3D model. But the printhead actually causes certain limitations. So, for instance, very steep edges cannot be printed, as you can see here, because the printhead will collide with already existing, um, will collide with already ex printed material. Also, two vertical edges also need to be spaced out at least one printhead diameter, because otherwise you also get a collision. So, therefore, Viaprint creates actually a new edge pattern, which needs to print the results. So it starts by printing a contour, then it prints a zigzag of a certain height, and then it prints the next contour on top. So let me show you one more object that illustrates this. So um, the printed constraints still allow for several ways to generate printable wireframes. So on the left side you see the approach that I've used so far, and it is particularly sturdy as all the vertical edges are aligned. Then on the right side you see a different edge pattern, and here the vertical lines are actually left out, which makes it less sturdy but even faster. So getting the wireframe to work also involved a lot of tweaking on the material side. So the first thing we had to tweak was extrusion speed. So this is one of our first vector prints we made. And as you can see, there is way too much material extruded. So there are two important factors involved to get this right. So the first one is the printhead speed. This is how much time the printhead needs to travel a certain distance. And there's also the extrusion rate, which is how much material is extruded by traveling that distance. So we did a little test to find out the correct extrusion rate for a given speed by simply varying the extrusion rate and looking what, what works best. Then the second thing we tweaked was the edge thickness. So with the standard extrusion nozzle of the 3 printer, we get very thin edges. So to have thicker extrusion, we used a hand drill to make the nozzle diameter a bit wider, which then leads to these more stable edges here. And finally, the most important thing to make bioprint work is to get the heating and the cooling right. So the most important thing here to understand is that the print speed is not limited by the 3D printer itself, but actually by the material and how fast it can solidify. So let's say you want to print this zigzag here and you print it full speed on your 3D printer. So what you're very likely going to see is something like this here, that the top corner actually deforms, which is certainly not what we want. So the reason is that when the plastic is extruded, it is actually warm and liquid. So to solidify, it needs to cool down, which means that the faster we can actually cool, the faster we can also print. So of course, we can always add additional cooling by adding hardware. So I just want to show you two um, additional cooling systems we built. This one here uses two blowers on the side and cools the print via the duct. 
And then if you want to have an even stronger cooling for even faster printing, you can also use a compressor, which is then connected via the air tubes here. So if additional hardware is not an option, we can also optimize the cooling in software. There are two options. The first one is we can print slower and let the material solidify as the printhead goes. And then the second option is we can print fast, but we can make a pause after each vertical edge. And surprisingly, the pause actually works best. So we came to this conclusion by running a, a short experiment in which we vary printing speed and pausing for the sphere here. So let me break this down for you a little bit. So here you see the sphere printed with slow speed and no pause. And as you can see, it takes more than 10 minutes. <coughs> So if you print that same sphere with high speed, but with a one second pause after each vertical edge, you can see it takes less than five minutes. So using a pause here works best. <coughs> so we were actually wondering why does the pause perform best? And the insight we gained here is that the print head actually keeps the filament under tension. So it's straight and it does not sag as long as the print head moves in the correct direction. So only when the printer actually changes the direction, you see these deformations happening, and the tension is gone. So this is why pausing works best, because the printhead only pauses when we change direction, and otherwise we go full speed. So the takeaway message here is basically, the print speed is not limited by the 3D printer itself, but by the material and how fast you can so cool and post solidify. So more cooling will lead to larger speedups. So given the printhead constraints and the material properties, the software implementation is actually rather straightforward here. So Vibrant just loads the 3D model as an STL file format, and then it slices the model by cutting it against a set of horizontal planes. And then the location of these slices is determined by important features on the model geometry, so we best preserve the overall shape. And then, as I already said, when we generate the zigzag pattern, we basically align all these vertical lines here for maximum stability. So to convert a model, the user can simply click on the wireframe tab. And then in the export view, the user can export the G-code for the 3D printer. And as you can see, the line order is already included. And then the GCO tells the 3D printer how to move at which speed and how much to extrude. So as you saw in this talk, we make five contributions. We demonstrated that vector printing is indeed faster than layer-wise printing, which makes it really useful for fast prototyping. We showed how to convert a standard 3D printer to a vector printer. We explained which meshes work on a 3-axis printer. And we also showed how to tweak the different parameters for printing, and we provide a software for the conversion. So as I said at the very beginning, BioPrint is really a made for design iteration of shape. So it should not be used when other factors matter, such as stability or when the model has many small details. So however, if you want to preview some detail with BioPrint, we have included one more feature. <laughs> So it combines layer-wise and wireframe printing. So as you can see here, the eye and the nose of the bunny head are printed as high detail while the remaining part is printed as a wireframe. All right, so in this talk, I presented wireprint, which is a technique for fast design iteration of shape. And on a very high level, wireprint is part of a larger concept, which we call low pass, in which all intermediate versions are printed as a fast low identity, and all the final versions are printed as a complete 3D print. 
So with this, I would like to end my talk and I'm happy to